as many of you, as some of you maybe know, maybe know you're going to hear about today, you're going to hear about Promising People, uh, a company that start, we were working on for five years. I'm the chairman of this company. And I asked to come here to give you an update on what's going on with Promising People. I have known this young man since he was 16 years old. When his family, we lived in Atlanta at the time, his family came from South Africa. They lived two houses away from us. And I'll let Rob tell the story about how we met. But the point was, this young man has made me a ton of money over the years. He was one of the producers of Blair Witch. And when I, I was the first investor in Blair Witch, I had bought three Blair Witch homes. I bought two Blair Witch cars. I took all my family and all their spouses on a Blair Witch cruise. So I'm telling you, this kid, I, I have invested in this kid, and I'm so delighted to have him now as the president of Promising People. So with that, as a UCF grad, I came, to, I even came down to Orlando for his graduation. His mother and father were our best friends, and his mother is a saint, uh, and my wife's best friend too. So with that, please give a rotary welcome to Rob Cowie. So it's 30 years ago, and my best friend is coming to visit me. I've been in the country for a month, and Daryl Chobalar is coming. I pick him up in my brand new Honda Civic, first car I've ever owned. I'm so proud of this car. It's beautiful. I pick him up. We come up. If any of you have ever lived in Atlanta, you know that it's pretty hilly. It's all kinds of hilly. And in actual fact, we lived on the top of the hill. As we were driving the city, pointed out all the great sites. We're almost home. We're so excited to be there. And I look across and there is one of the most amazing, beautiful sites in Atlanta. This young lady walking a puppy across the lawn. At which point I naturally indicate that to Daryl. And I know that this happened exactly how it happens because what I didn't know is her father was standing on the stairs with a video camera because he had just given said puppy to his daughter as a birthday present. I indicate and look over and kind of go over like this. And in the process being 16, drag on the steering wheel, bam! Hit his brick mailbox. Total my car. My father had said, we are guaranteed to get sued in the United States because they do that in the US. Do not do anything to cause a lawsuit. My life was over. This is the worst thing that could possibly have happened. Except I got to go on a date <laughs> with the beautiful Chrissy. I got to be mentored and taught uh, just friendship, years and years of laughter and joy. My dad's best friend, Rich's wife became my mom's best friend. They played tennis together. And yes, it did result in the Blair Witch Project and so many other things. So if you take nothing else away from what I have to say today, oftentimes, the worst thing that can happen to you is actually the best. So thank you, Rich Angero, for everything you are, uh, as my friends say, a mensch and a wonderful, wonderful person. So we're here to talk about promising. And this is a quick video that gives you an overview. I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't have really any money. You know, you never really expect to land in prison. We didn't know what was to come. We didn't know what was going to happen. As a convicted felon, where am I going to work? How am I going to provide for my family? How am I going to turn my life around so that I don't end up back in here? I lost my father-in-law while I was there. Well, um, they were holding me without bail. She can't imagine what it's like to have people come and arrest you. 700,000 people are being let out every year. 
and they're being let out without help. Welcome to my new normal. You need people that's going to give you a blueprint. A lot of these guys don't know which way they're going to go. They don't know who to call, who to turn to. And I think promising people will be that change in agent. Just, just holding their hand and walking them through a process. You want to be someone who can overcome any challenge, who can become self-sufficient, who can um, look back in your rearview mirror and say, I got through this and I am even better. We've got to do something about it and we've got to do something about it now. And every minute that we wait, more people get let out without hope. Developing our mechanical skills is one of the greatest things. What's unique now about virtual reality is that uh, there are so many issues and challenges that we face that it addresses. Whether it's a factor of cost or danger or it just in physical location inconvenience. When you step into the shoes of somebody else who knows something, you're able to experience it through their hands, through their eyes, through their process. That's the most incredible way to learn. I generally think that this is a really good program. I can see how it could actually become something very beneficial and that there's gonna be good use in it. The fundamental simple tasks of like use a tape measure, or where you need to be. I've heard about stuff that's kind of similar to stuff like that, but I've never actually done it or seen it. Um, I could see how that can be very helpful for like somebody who's never picked up any tools before. I hope that promising people reaches not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of people and generates such evidentiary results of success that people take note and realize that here is a new category of learning and promising people already in its hands has the ability to do that. Um, so I'm eight years old, there's a banging on the door and uh, I go to the door, I open it and there's a man in front of me who has a knife, it's called a panga, inserted into his skull. I scream, I slam the door and yell for my father. I'm alone at home with my dad. He comes running with or he's in a, basically a puddle of blood in the front door. We scoop him up, put him in the car, race as fast as we can to the hospital. And when we get to the hospital, a woman comes out and says, no, 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 not here. You need to go to the hospital. And so we had to put the man back in the car drive to the black hospital which was two hours away and when we finally get this gentleman into the hospital they said to us i'm sorry he's dead and they said we can't take the body you need to take the body to wherever it's from i we didn't know but there was a township right down the way from where we lived and we went into that township and we drove in and put this body in the middle of the town and all these people gathered around that body and, uh, and took, took the body away. That was how I discovered apartheid South Africa. And I'm still trying to land at Over 100 million people in the United States who have around 100 million. At any point in time, there are 10 million people behind bars, 2 million people on federal charges. Every year, they release 700,000 people out into the population. And the United States has by far the incarcer highest incarcerated record. In fact, if you took the top 32 states in the United States, the next country comes in at 33. If you wait five years, 90% of the people that get released go back into prison. We spend about $160 billion every year on our current incarceration system. And we fail to educate, we fail to train, we fail to help this population. We are in a crisis not only of corrections, not only of justice, but we are also in a, a crisis of tradespeople. How many people can easily access an electrician 
or a plumber or an HVAC specialist or anyone like that, anyone who's in the trades. It's difficult. It's hard to find them. And let me tell you, if you're in prison and you're trying to get somebody to teach a program in prison who's a qualified electrician, forget about it. It's really difficult to get those expertise. Promising People was founded at the intersection of solving these two problems. On one side, the trades crisis, and on the other side, the, 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 the justice involved crisis. There's a couple of problems that you have if you're trying to solve these problems, and I'm gonna go into them in the next few minutes. We have two organizations, one organization that is focused on learning, uh, and the other organization that we're just getting started now is on placement. Because if you come out of prison and you try and get a job, 99% of the HR people will not hire you. So what we're doing with our placement company is we're hiring them and then actually leasing them out. So we're providing that layer of insulation between us and the employer. But we're also a faith-based organization and we have a nonprofit it's a sister company, it's a separate staff, separate board, everything like that. And that organization is centered around connecting people with faith-based organizations. One of our biggest partners in this is the Salvation Army because they do such incredible work. But we want to get people connected with a pro-social group. The group of peers that they had going in was a challenge. We need to get them with a pro-social group afterwards and that's the missions company. So our purpose is to get people jobs, period. We don't only work with incarcerated people. Uh, we also work with people who are, uh, are dealing with in, uh, addiction uh, or in some form of recovery, simply come from a low income level, um, or frankly are returning from military service and they need to get help. I'm, I, I'm the greatest recipient of a fantastic education at the University of Central Florida. I love my education, but the, all of our customers, they don't have a car. They don't have a way to get to Valencia. They don't have a way to physically get their education. So we try and meet them where they are by getting our tools in their hands without them having to go anywhere. We, we spend uh, about a hundred and Okay, slowing it down. <laughs> Got it, thank you. It keeps on changing on me. All right, I'll just, I'll just pick up here. I already talked about the size of the population. The other reason why we started, you know, I told you the trades crisis and, and the justice involved crisis, but there is a new funding mechanism that has now been put in place. It's very recent. It actually starts July 1st. Uh, President Trump signed it into action. It's called the Prison Education Program. It's also known as Pell for All, and it's just getting started. In this process, they bring uh, justice involved organizations, education organizations, and then uh, pri private business together to solve this education and training problem. And so what we've been doing over the last three years is developing tools that articulate into the system that is launching on July 1st. We're signing people up officially in October. So we have been uh, working with, with that uh, Pell, Pell Grant opportunity. There are many other sources of financing for what, for, for what we're doing um, because there are people who are working on workforce development. There are people who are working on uh, the prevention side of this, working at the high school level. Um, we, we don't only just serve people who are behind bars. And so there are other sources of revenue and we've been figuring out how to build, put these together. Our missions company also works in the grant space where we're optimizing grants. So, the opportunity here for us is to uh, increase enrollment for universities. Um, so for example, we just came from Palm Beach State where they have an existing second chance program, but they do it the old analog way. They actually go in there and teach people you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Like I told you earlier, there's a crisis and shortage of teachers. You can't get them there, but we're now working to extend their program uh, digitally. So 
I should get into that uh, uh, in, in a second here, because these are the kinds of problems that we are facing uh, behind bars. There, there's simply a lack of space. If anyone has spent any time in a, in a uh, corrections facility, there's no space in these prisons. Um, there's a tremendous strain since COVID, uh, volunteers have dropped off, staff has dropped off. Uh, so there's a tremendous strain on the actual staff itself. Uh, and there's a huge cost to coming in there and teaching over and over again. Uh, the cost of equipment, just computers and such is, is very high. The uh, barriers to bring in things, if you wanna teach somebody trades, uh, try bringing in a, a, a full, like try bringing in a bandsaw into a prison environment. Uh, it's challenging. <laughs> I guarantee you won't get, get past the gate. Uh, and then when people come out, they, uh, sorry, when people are transferred out of the prison from one prison to another, there's a completely different system in each one of those prisons. So having something that is consistent is, is very, very difficult to do. Uh, most of the times you have no access to Wi-Fi at all. So anything that works traditionally, and you know, there's a lot of uh, distanced education, a lot of technology out there that will work from a distance, all of that doesn't work because you have no Wi-Fi. Uh, so <laughs> it's not surprising that there's been a long history of education and training failing uh, in, in that system. Our solution works anywhere. It works without internet access. It can be used in an asynchronous manner. So it works at any time. Uh, and it, you, you can use it at your own pace. We call it the teacher in the headset. All the instruction, when you first go into it, you see stereo 3D video that actually shows you real tools being used in a real situation. That's kind of the first stage. The second stage is that we have a digital simulation. So a simulation of that real, real video that you just saw. And in that second stage, you'll hear instruction that teaches the person from the point of view of the person doing the job, how to do that job. And then the third stage is that same simulator, but now we take the instruction away and the person in the headset actually has to do the work. We use AI machine learning to actually grade what they're doing. So it's not just a quiz or a test. It's physically, what are you doing? Are you doing the wiring in the right order? Are you stripping it the right way? Are you bending the conduit in the right way? All of that happens in the headset, no Wi-Fi. We have shown a 400% increase in the effectiveness of this training. People learn faster, they retain it longer. Uh, in one situation in New Mexico, we have 80 people in a learning dormitory in a prison where it's a privilege to be in that prison. So they're using it as a disciplinary measure. If you don't cooperate, you're out of the program. Nobody's dropped out of that program yet. <laughs> they all wanna be in there because it's an incredibly transformative process uh, to use this system. So the way the company works, we're not just a VR company. I have a technology background. I, I, may, I was at Madden for five years. I, 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 I ran the Madden program. I worked with FIFA. I was working with Seed. I did a lot of the uh, research and development, uh, which is EA's research and development side. I, I worked with them. So I have a very strong tech background. Um, but what we do is not just VR, it's not just technology, it's really understanding this matrix because you have to connect corrections facilities with higher education, with the US Department of Education, it's an entire system. So a lot of what we do has got nothing to do with technology, it really has to do with bringing the right people together in the right way. So it's a superior solution. Uh, it's turnkey prison education program. We've got funding in place. Um, it's automated data. This is another thing that's really important. The PEPs rely on data being actually given. Right now, they don't do a lot of data reporting in prisons at all. And we need to know 
what, what really counts is are people getting jobs? So we're currently doing nine pilots. One of our pilots is simply with people who are not behind bars, but are just learning to be electricians. And we need to know that the, the content that we're providing actually makes a good electrician. So to give you an example of that, it takes seven to nine months to train an electrical helper. And it costs about $7,000 to do that work. Our program, five days of VR immersion, three hours a day out of their eight hour day, giving them on the job training, five hours they're working for three weeks. In one month, we're more effective and much less expensive than what they're currently doing. So even beyond outside of the bars, what we're doing is really powerful. We don't only do electrical helpers. We have a whole program, a whole suite of, of uh, education. Uh, what we have done is, is actually licensed other trades. So currently we provide uh, plumbing and HVAC and other, these, these are not original things that we've created. They're the best of the best that we've actually licensed and put together. So it's not just uh, those programs, but this gives you an idea of how in depth uh, the work that we do. This is 65 uh, lessons. Uh, the first one is orientation. Uh, we also, about 60%, uh, 60 percent of the people who are in prison don't have a ged and so we provide a solution that basically helps people get their ged or the ged equivalency um, through through a program that we call the ability to benefit uh, these are some of the other programs that we're currently doing right now as well so um, in, in short there's a massive problem uh, in trades there's a massive problem in corrections this is a first of its kind uh, technology. Uh, we absolutely need help uh, because it's a complicated problem. And so if I had an ask from anybody here, if you know of somebody that wants to get involved uh, or, or cares about this, may have a perspective, we need help from the government level. We need help from the corrections level. We need help in, in higher education at universities. Uh, and frankly, we're, we're, we're still raising money for, for, for what we've been doing. So we need private equity investment to finish out our round. But um, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I'd, I'd love to take any questions that you have. But uh, I have a son in prison, believe it or not, or in jail uh, for drugs. And about uh, talking to corrections officer down there, about 60% of the people are in there for drug related crimes. Uh, you know, there, there are problems or there are reasons that he has low self esteem. What can be done about this? He went to Emory for a year, by the way. Yeah, no, that, that, those are great questions. Um, so uh, it, it's, this is a holistic solution. It, it's not just a, a case of uh, a GD education or trades education. Uh, there's a lot of really effective, uh, and, and it's funny that you bring this up. We, we I, I actually, my breakfast meeting this morning uh, is with the industrial psychologist that has been doing a lot of work uh, in what they call soft skills, but really it's the kind of the psychology of, of, of what people are dealing with. Um, and so currently a lot of their programs are you know, analog, they do teach in prisons. What we're talking about is partnering with them. They're, they're all over the country. We're talking about partnering with them to actually bring uh, those sessions into the headset uh, and then using artificial intelligence, that kind of thing. You can start to have interactions that essentially are like therapy in a headset. So uh, there's a lot of mental illness, mental health, uh, psychological problems, therapeutic problems, drug addiction problems, you know, all, all of these, some of the investors in our organization right now, they, they own recovery clinics. So we're, we're using their, their, uh, you know, their, their uh, processes to, to address this. So uh, the, the deeper I get into this, uh, the bigger it is, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to make really good partnerships. Um, I, I mean, I'd love to talk to you afterwards, sir. And uh, we hire justice involved people who are, who are out. Uh, we work with people, you know, very, very directly. Um, and it, it is uh, it is very, very challenging. But unfortunately, for a long time, uh, there hasn't been a lot done, you know, to, to it, to, to help. 
And, uh, and we're just trying to do our small part to try and try and change that. Yes, sir. Great project uh, and a wonderful program. Appreciate you being here. But I was curious, what's your acceptance in the workplace? I mean, are employers willing to hire people coming out of prison that have these certificates? And have you gone to the like the, uh, the unions, the trade unions? Are they like yeah. helping you? Are they assisting so, you? So, so both, both excellent questions. Thank you. So uh, first of all, we have a partnership with a national organization that actually uh, Rich was the, the mentor to the CEO and, and president of that organization. You guys may know them. They're called SHRM. Uh, and SHRM uh, nationally represents HR uh, members. And they've, they've had a you know, get, get people back to work uh, initiative for a couple of years. Uh, the reason why we've done this partnership with them and we have an MOU, we work into an investment from them is the placement company that I mentioned before because people will pay it good lip service um, and say, yes, we will do it, but they're really reluctant to go into that HR nightmare. And that's why we created the HR company. It wasn't because we wanted to create a, a, a leasing company. It's just, we have an expertise in this area. And so we understand how to do the filtering and the education and the, you know, all of that stuff. And so we're gonna be working directly with Sherm uh, in, that, in that placement place. But uh, it is, there are, there is a turn. There is definitely a turn. So, so the answer to the first part is yes, employers will at least they say they will, but we've now partnered with SHRM to answer some of their concerns. So there is employees who will do that. Unions, absolutely. Um, we're working in Louisiana right now, in New York right now with, with uh, two different union groups. Uh, they need members, they need workers, they need these programs. Uh, now, understandably, they have very high criteria. And so when you come out of our program, you have kind of three different pathways. One, you can go to work, like we train you so you can get a job. Two, you could go back to school and everything that we do articulates into an education path. And three, you could go into an, a pre-apprenticeship or an apprenticeship program, which could go the union way or could go the open shop way. So, uh, but the short answer to the union question is absolutely, they're very enthusiastic. This is brand new technology, never, never really possible until now. Yes, sir. No, uh, you're doing a great job of answering a large part of the recidivism problem. Yes, sir. But to follow up on Stuart's question here, the other part is addiction. I mean, that is huge. 60%, somebody said 60% was, was direct drugs. The number's much higher when you look at drug involvement through some other thing than just straight addiction. I have a friend whose son just got out of prison. His problem is drug addiction. His crime wasn't drug addiction. It was theft or whatever. I don't even know what it was. But to my amazement, his probation does not include Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous. That used to be a given. What, what I mean, and that's not yeah. 100%. I'm not saying that's 100% cure, but it's a fall off the log backwards answer. And what's your experience, how the no, I mean, uh, system is addressing that? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we have partnered with the Salvation Army, because they have so much expertise in this area. It's another one of the reasons why one of our investors is, you know, this is their area of, of, of expertise is addiction. Um, and, you know, you can't cure addiction necessarily in the headset, unfortunately, um, but uh, you can get good education that way. And then we also, when we go in, we have holistic uh, solutions. So we make sure that we address as much as possible the partners that we have who, who have those solutions. Uh, you know, addiction is a very complicated uh, challenge, but, but we're doing our best to, to bring in the right people to address it. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you again for your talk. I found it very interesting. You mentioned during your talk that uh, you're trying to measure the effectiveness of the VR education. And I'm, I'm curious if you could expand on that a little bit. Yep. I'm imagining that, uh, that like, as the video showed, you can, you can make it look very realistic in, in the video of, of the skills that they're being taught. But what about the component then where it needs to have kind of a tactile yep. involvement where they know what it's like to hold a hammer or to crawl into a crawl space or to work in a, a, yeah. a you know, yeah. hot environment? What, how do, do you introduce those skills to so that they're ready for the actual yeah. work part of it? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, so 
there's all kinds of different security levels and and sometimes there's no security it's open so uh what we focus on the headset is neural knowledge neural experience but then we actually created physical simulators um, that are a very small footprint uh, it looks like a wooden frame if you've ever got an electrician background at all it looks very similar to some of the structures there except it's designed for reps and we're able to take that frame into literally a yard and set that up and then it echoes everything that we did in the videos in the digital experience and then in the physical experience because you're absolutely right it's one thing to know how to operate a drill it's another thing to pick it up and actually do the drilling uh, and so that is the fourth component of what we're doing is on-site training so uh, when i mentioned earlier the tri-city electric project one week of vr three weeks using our frames to teach people the hands-on side of those tools so uh, that gets them that and then we work with NCCER and other certif certification boards so that the testing actually happens with the tools um, the reason why we went you know took it from seven to nine months down to one month is that our guys know what they're doing before they get to do the hands-on I just want to enlighten a couple of questions you guys have had. Uh, but what we did is we learned that in the in the prison system, they don't really want the people to get out of out of the uh, out of their reach. So they make it very difficult. So when we go in, we hired a company to do our technology. We hired a company that did Air Force simulation, 3D Air Force simulation. And, and we told them when we put the headsets on, the one thing we want everybody to say as soon as we put the headsets on is wow. So we use 3D color simulation in it. We hired a guy from Disney whose job it is to reduce uh, motion sickness. So he helped us with the, with the glasses and so on. When we did this and we went to Polk County, there was a warden there. Every warden told us the same thing. Nope, I'm not gonna do any more things. We're, we're maxed out. We have no time for this stuff and on and on and on. And then we had the warden and all the people put the glasses on. As soon as they put the glasses on, they were like, everybody was like, wow. Okay, so then we showed them that. So then we said to them, when they get out of prison, we're gonna get them a certificate and then we're gonna hire them. We're like Kelly Services, we're gonna hire them and we will put them, if you don't like them the next day, you don't like the color of their hair or whatever, we'll change them, we'll give you somebody else. And so when we said to the, to the warden, when they get out, they're gonna get a certificate and they could go in and they could make union wages. She cried. She said, you are, a, you are an answer to my prayers. And as we've gone out and talked to prisoners and talked to wardens and in the prison system where they have no tolerance for anything at all until they put the glasses on. As soon as they put the glasses on, it was like, wow. Now, here's one more thing. When that, when that prisoner gets out of prison, uh, he's been trained on specific tools. He gets a toolbox. He comes with tools. Every electrical company we've talked to has said, that's incredible. Because when we hire a new electrician, he's always borrowing somebody's tools. No, no. Our people, they have their own tools and the tools they have are exactly the tools that they saw in the video on the headsets because we worked with a vendor to be able to do that as well. So they come self-sufficient. Robin, thanks for what you're doing and thanks for being here today. We appreciate it so yeah, much. Appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. We got a little gift of appreciation for you here. Thank you. And uh, yeah. hold it by the bottom there. And uh, would you come back and talk about Blair Rich sometime? <laughs> Anytime. All right. We'd love to. That's one more program. <laughs>